All right, so um, welcome everyone to uh, today's Zoom seminar. So it's really my uh, great pleasure to welcome today's uh, speaker, Dr. Takmak. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to actually have him on our uh, platform. So I just want to give a brief introduction of Dr. Mark. I guess a lot of us actually already know. Um, he actually, uh, currently Dr. Takmak is uh, a, a professor in Department of uh, Medical Biophysics and Immunology in University of Toronto in Canada. And also he is a uh, director of Advanced Medical Discovery Institute, uh, University Health Network in Toronto. So uh, Tak actually uh, completed his uh, bachelor degree in University of Wisconsin, uh, major in biochemistry, and then uh, continue his study uh, with master's degree also in University of Wisconsin. Uh, further, he actually pursued his <clears throat> PhD in University of uh, Alberta in, in Canada, which also he uh, studied uh, biochemistry. Um, I cannot actually completely cover his, uh, his resume because he has about uh, over uh, 290 different uh, publications and over 100 pages of CV. So I actually got a lot of his introduction from Wikipedia. Uh, I think um, a lot of us actually know uh, Dr. Uh, Mark from his actually previous work of his uh, major discovery uh, of T-cell receptor uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Davis in Stanford in 1983, uh, which is really a foundation for uh, a lot of us. Now it's in the textbook. And in 1993, uh, his lab actually started to generate one of the very first knockout mice. And then and after that, he has generated a lot of more knockout animal uh, than any other lab in the world. Uh, I think when I was in PhD, we always talk about king of the transgenic mice uh, with, uh, as the title of Dr. Tagmark. Uh, 1995, uh, Mark published a landmark paper on the discovery of the function of immune checkpoint protein, CTL4, which is also a, a really milestone for uh, cancer immunology, which also opened the path of immunotherapy inhibitors as a means of uh, cancer treatment. Uh, besides that, he also is founder of uh, uh, Aljord's uh, Pharmacologist, which is a company uh, leads to the compound has been approved by FDA for acute uh, myeloid le le leukemia in uh, 2017 and become the very first drug uh, specific targeting cancer metabolism to be used for uh, cancer treatment. Currently, uh, Dr. Mark's lab is interested in um, the uh, interconnection between the brain and the immune system, which uh, he actually is particularly interesting study T cell, B cell producing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and specifically uh, the, the Dr. Talks, uh, Talk Mark's group uh, elucidated the mechanism of action by which these uh, neurotransmitter producing by T cells may be connected to the autoimmunities. Uh, but furthermore, his lab also uh, working obviously on immune response and tumor genesis. Um, his work uh, mainly now currently focuses on the uh, PTAM, which designed several mouse models, uh, bearing PTAM uh, mutations, uh, which potentially can be highly useful for studying uh, the oncogenesis. Um, Tark's actually honor and then award is really numerous. Uh, I think the most important uh, Tark currently is a Royal Society, Society member of Canada. And he also elected as a foreign associate to the National Academy of Science in discipline of immunology. And he's also international uh, member of uh, American Academy of Science and, and, uh, and Arts. Um, 20, uh, 2009, he introduced into uh, Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. And also he is awarded as top 25 Canadian uh, immigrant awards. He has over, uh, as I said, over uh, 995 um, previous review papers and then citation over a hundred thousand uh, times. It's really remarkable. So without further ado, uh, welcome uh, talk and uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Okay, uh, thank you for uh the invitation. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Fine. Uh, can you hear the point? Can you see the pointer? 
Uh, yes, we can. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you very much for this kind invitation. Today's talk uh, is uh, actually the title was um, lifted from a review that we recently wrote uh, in the Nature Review Drug Discovery and uh, last year. And uh, it is called uh, Beyond Immune Checkpoint Blockade Emerging Strategies. I have trouble advancing myself. Okay, yeah. So now about 400 years ago, a French playwright said that doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less into patients of whom we know nothing. And up to today, of course, a lot of progress has been made and it is our our job, I guess, as scientists, to improve upon, uh, you know, not only just the drugs that we know, but also the disease that we are trying to cure. And of course, they are both related. Now, it's been really a kind of a problem for the post chemotherapy era, as well as the era in which anti-oncogene have been pretty much over um, in terms of targeting activated or gain-of-function oncogenes. So I, my premise is that we have now to go back and study really in details the, 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 the not as much as the cart that is important, not the horse that is driving, because that's oncogenes, but the cart, in other words, the cellular fate. And it's what I call fire and water, because you have the stress between metabolic adaptation, you have the DNA damage and DNA repair, and then you have, of course, immune activate and immune homeostasis. So I'm having problem advancing my slide. There is a delay, I guess. Now, in terms of metabolism, it's interesting to go back and think that not so long ago, 1966, some of you were not born, but I certainly was, that it was really considered the origin of cancer was not viruses, was not genes, but the cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in normal body cells by fermentation of sugar. And it's a group of Nobel laureates who decided that was the case. Now, what they're trying to say was that cancer cells have different metabolisms than normal cells in the sense that even in the presence of oxygen, while yeast would not make a lot of lactate, yeah. but cancer cells would. And so that allow us to eventually come to the understanding that what Maybe the problem is that the, the, the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor gene actually reprogram uh, the metabolism of the cancer cells. And in such a way that the oncogenes and tumor suppression, they change the metabolic phenotype and in so affect the bioenergetics, biosynthesis, and the redox. So that's how we actually knew that that was happening, but how can we target it? So 
there it's a very complicated because there are 2500 genes in metabolism and it's very difficult to connect them as they are highly highly redundant and 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 really very versatile and you can see here that our labs as well as other labs have over the years came to the conclusion that maybe these things are just one step at a time you have an oncogene you have tumor suppressor gene then change and then this balance at the end maybe we can actually target it by rebalancing it so i i i'm only going to touch upon one a particular one and this is the one that um you know we i mean uh uh, this is Craig Thompson, the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, this is uh, Lou Cantley, a Cancer Center Director at Cornell. Um, we, we, back in about now over a dozen years, got really interested in this and started a company called Agios. And at that time, there were several mutations uh, that were found in these cancer cells. Um, the first um, was uh, discovered in gliomas um, by Bert Vogelstein's group. And then others, including ourselves, uh, we discovered that the T cell leukemia, AITL, was also uh, mutated on these isocitrate dehydrogenase and very well studied is AML and others. Now, this is a very interesting mutation. It is not a mutation that is a gain of function as in oncogenes or a loss of function as in tumor suppressor gene, but it's a neomorphic mutation. In other words, the mutation actually takes the product of the wild type IDH and brings it into a new metabolite, which we call oncometabolite. So what this oncometabolite do is to reprogram mainly through the alpha ketoglutarate dependent dioxygenases uh, into uh, some kind of a state that would allow the transformation or at least the in this case, you can see similar to a myelodysplastic syndrome. So we 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 made the knock in mice, and uh, and indeed that uh, actually uh, revealed some of the properties, and that uh, led us to eventually tease out really complicated because there are three different mutations, and there are other mutations like TET2, which only happen in T-cell leukemia and lymphomas. And uh, these papers are just now being um, in revision and they will come out true soon. But what it really boils down to was that the oncometabolite 2-hydroxyglutarate can reprogram the dioxygenases allowing the gene regulations and then eventually change the mechanisms of survival proliferation etc and lead to different diseases now because you know most of these mutations are associated with as in case of aml and other many other different mutations one would not have a priori thought that by an, in making an inhibitor you can actually reverse uh, the situation. And we were really, really lucky uh, because um, the AGIOS went on to make the mutation uh, inhibitors. And what's interesting was the patients at the refractory relapse, um, you can see that the blast is coming down here, but you can see the hematocrit is going up. Now, treating with chemotherapy, you will not see the blast coming down and the hemoglobin and the white cells going up because chemotherapy is killing them. So this says that it is reprogramming so that the cells 
can actually now differentiate. But what is quite satisfying is that a percentage of the patients given the drug had actually had a prolonged benefit of this particular uh, uh, treatment. So that was very satisfying. And so that's, uh, it was said in the introduction for AML, uh, it is now being approved. A cholangial carcinoma has also have a, have a positive trial uh, that was recently published. Uh, and I guess a lot of us are waiting to see what gliomas do. Now, not that I had expected, but we came across that the isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation also changed uh, the DNA repair uh, in the sense that it was reducing uh, epigenetically uh, the ATM messenger RNA. And in fact, that would lead to some DNA damage. So you can see that DNA damage is part of uh, cancer development. And that leads us to DNA damage and DNA repair. Now, for cancer cells, some of you may find it's quite surprising that the normal 46 chromosomes in the normal cells, some cancer cells have as many, if not more than 100 chromosomes. And you can see overall about even a third of them have chromosomes that are oh, over 3N, which is quite amazing. And the more these have chromosome, the worse the prognosis. And that is a, a fact that we need to deal with. So the question is, wh why do cancer cells or they get away with replicating even in the presence of so many chromosomes when, when normal cells hardly can get away with in extra one, except in the case of Down syndrome. And how can, what can we do to, to stop this? So that the trend and the thinking of the POP inhibitor and topoisomerase is already there. And it's saying, well, if you can deal with this much chromosome instability, I'm gonna make you a cancer cell deal with even more. And that way, that severe aneuploidy will lead to cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. And this is what's a review that we wrote a few years ago. Now, so what are, would be the targets? So we took a few years and basically uh, discovered that the targets are those that are involved in centrial duplication uh, enzyme called POK4, you can see here, central duplication. They had two centrioles uh, in a normal cell, but in a cancer cell, you can see so many other centrioles. And in a complex karyotype, you can see the centrioles. And in fact, the enzyme level uh, shown by Carmen Wong at Hong Kong University is about 10x for the central duplication. And the spindle assembly checkpoint, we found a target uh, called TTK or MPS1. And that's even up a hundred top fold. And you can see the green color here, tremendously high uh, compared to the normal cells. So um, over a period of five years, we got together with a, a group of cameras led by Homer Pierce, and Henry Paul, um, we came up with some really, really specific inhibitors. Uh, we made thousands of analogs to, to get that. And you can see here, this one, the central duplication leads to the inability of the centrioles uh, to actually uh, recluster and, uh, and also for the spindle assembly checkpoint, again, one nanomolar IC50, uh, they cannot complete their uh, chromosome segregation. So um, 
put this into the clinic and uh, you can see here that uh, there's some really interesting activity. This is a refractory lab, RAS material colon for the central duplication. You can see the tumor uh, shrinking. And that um, for AML, uh, which for a P53 complex character AML, the prognosis is really very, very poor. Here is the survival of the patients right down here, basically down to days. Uh, um, from diagnosis. And, uh, and so, it does, you can see here, this patients and several of them actually responded quite well. 50% blast here in cycle one, day one, uh, by the end of cycle, you're down to 1% uh, or less. And so, uh, actually, yesterday, uh, uh, we were able to um, 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 obtained from FDA a fast track vaccination of this drug uh, for AML for, for that particular reason. Now, the second drug uh, is a central uh, is a spindle assembly checkpoint uh, called TTK or MPS1. And in the dose escalation, we were shocked that basically mainly the responders. And it was one liver respond uh, uh, at very, very low dose. But what we saw was all the breast cancer that was responding. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost all the uh, refractory relapsed breast cancer actually responded. You can see here, uh, there's a single agent. The, the, the tumor is essentially gone after two cycles. And that uh, in this patient, again, the tumor had uh, shrunk considerably. Now, what, what is significant here is that these are patients that are progressed after CDK4-6, uh, which is a, a, a DNA damage checkpoint uh, from G1 to S. And these patients are uniformly progressed uh, but when they progress, there, there, there is very little uh, option. Uh, and that for us to be able to, to, to obtain some responses, I think it's just, a, a, you know, very, very lucky. And, and so the, mechanistically, what we think uh, these inhibitors are actually hitting uh, downstream of cycling ECDK2 which is a very difficult target, CDK2. A lot of companies have tried for the last 20 years and, and really hadn't uh, helped. And so maybe we are in that position. Now, what I also wanted to point out here is that these patients um, actually that responded uh, to uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, drugs, uh, when they when they relapsed, they uh, responded very well to uh, immunotherapy, suggesting as if these drugs actually were able to make them um, more immunogenic. We don't know the mechanisms, uh, but we suspect perhaps it has something to do with sea gas sting and uh, and. And so CGAS, of course, was discovered by James Chan. I understand is going to be giving a talk in this series uh, uh, later on this year. Now, so that comes down to what I think is really important for the young people, or for even for the old people to remember. That Confucius said, we all have two lives, uh, but the second one, begins when we realize we only have one. The medical scientists, I think, have two lives. The second one begins when we realize that immunology is the orchestra for all symphonies, because it is involved not only in infections or immune disease transplantation, but also in cancer, and I think in neurodegeneration. So that brings me to the last part of my talk, immuno therapy and immunology. Now, immunology is very complicated. And Lao Ji, another 
Chinese philosopher said, countless words count less than the silent balance between the yin and the yang. And the yin and the yang leads to inflammation, recognition, activation, proliferation, homeostasis, and inflammation again. And that lingering inflammation is in fact a major part of many, many diseases, uh, including autoimmune disease, immune degeneration, and cancer. This is the root of the problem. It's a price we have to pay for eliminating the pathogens. So as it was said in the introduction, our laboratory kind of stumbled onto a gene called CTLA-4 that we published in 1993. This gene is the brick uh, for the T cells. As you can see, without it, the, the, the mouse actually dies about two to three weeks after birth, uh, basically because the mouse is filled with T cells. And so, of course, I had no idea given the work of Stutman in 1975, who told us uh, that newt mice uh, can actually uh, control a free methylcarantin tumor just as well as, as normal mice, that the immune cells have nothing to do with controlling cancer. So I was, even though you know we discovered CTLA force function, uh, I was basically cursing the darkness. My friend Jim Allison lit the candle, and of course, the rest is history together with the work of Tasco Honjo immunotherapy came into play. And now a lot of the cancers respond very well. A lot of the cancers don't respond at all. And we don't really know why. And that is the question. When we give a patient an immune checkpoint, what are the T cells doing? And we don't really know why. And so, so in fact, it didn't stop everybody. Then over 2,000 clinical trials going on, combining different aspects of immuno immunology uh, with checkpoint blockades. Uh, but the but the result has been rather disappointing. Other than chemotherapy, radiation, and to some extent, um, you know, angiogenesis, there is very little that is being made that is transformative beyond the first immune checkpoints. So what do we understand? How can we actually change that? And so it's very complicated. This is actually the review that I alluded to in the beginning. I just came out last year um, and it described many different aspects of the tumor microenvironment and I don't want to go into it because I don't understand it and it's really, really tough. So, but one step that we were able to contribute is that T cells become exhausted. It's just, they fight and they fight and they fight. And after many, many cycles. And in fact, remember T cells divide every five hours. That is shortest division than any other cells that I can think of. Well, of course, I mean, we're talking about mammalian cells here. So um, two postdocs, um, Mark Pellegrini and Thomas Kelsowski, actually found that interleukin-7 was a very, very good uh, ability to reverse the exhaustion of these uh, T cells. Um, and you can see here, uh, by adding interleukin-7, uh, this mouse tumor, instead of, uh, of living extra 10, 20 days, live another 100 days uh, because interleukin-7 prevents the T cell from being exhausted. And the mechanism was worked out. It was an inhibition of the inhibitors of T cell activation, which of course is 
very, very important. So now, one nagging question, really, of course, when T cells get activated, most of the time they get activated in in the peripheral blood. So they they actually have to get out of the vasculature to go into the tissue sites. So there's adhesion, um, there is chemokines, but what else is there? And for decades, people don't think there is anything else. So here's Walt Warburg again. Science progressed not because scientists changed their minds, but because scientists attached to erroneous views died and they are replaced. Now, does the brain talk to the immune system? Does the immune system talk to the brain? Uh, this is a, um, a great student of mine a, a few years back. Uh, he's now uh, the head of cell therapy in a company that we, we, we recently started. His name is Sean Kubley. Now, when he studied earlier in his career that birds, the songbirds here, uh, they actually um, cannot survive on good looks gay because if their immune system is down, they cannot sing good songs when they grow up. So that is interesting that there are these connections between the brain and the immune system. And there is, in fact, 173 years ago, there was some suspicions that the brain actually talks to the immune system. Because when the nerves are actually activated, the spleen moved. Now the spleen, as we all know, is almost nothing but immune cells. So why would be the nerves coming from your brain activate uh, the, 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 the spleen? So back in 1877, um, Bogart actually traced these nerves all over the body and came to the conclusion that it, it goes into the spleen. Now, for those of you who remember neurobiology, there is a dilemma here. There is a dilemma because the, the nerves that go into the spleen are parasympathetic and they make acetylcholine, okay? And the sympathetic nerves makes the norepinephrine. So this is the fire and this is the water. So norepinephrine activates and acetylcholine calm down, right? Now, that was fine. But you can see here, a Chinese group actually were able to show that the, this is the spleen, thymus, pipette, mesenteric lymph node, they all have nerves. But remember, this is tyrosine hydroxylase and it is staining norepinephrine. So why then, is the parasympathetic nerves going into the spleen and make norepinephrine instead of acetylcholine, which doesn't make any sense. And it turned out that just before it goes into the spleen, the parasympathetic nerves through a celiac ganglion switch back to the sympathetic nerve and they make norepinephrine. Then who is making the acetylcholine in the spleen? which has been known for about 50 years, uh, in fact, 70 years. So that is very, very strange. So in order to actually get to the bottom of it, Kevin Tracy, a brilliant uh, neurosurgeon in New York, and us collaborated about a dozen years ago and say, if we take an acetylcholine translate GRP mouse. What cells would you find 
in the spleen that is making the acetylcholine. And of course, that takes acetyl-CoA and choline into acetylcholine, and that's how we form the synapse. Wow. We found not only the T cells making acetylcholine, but also the B cells making acetylcholine. But they're not making that much of it, just a couple percent. And it's not that very impressive both in T cells and B cells. It's just at the beginning, half my lab's now working on this. I don't have a lot of time to get involved because one more topic I wanted to share with you before this. Um, but the key question really was an American postdoc, Maureen Cox, came to our lab and she infected this mouse with GFP uh, at, on, on, on T cells and found that after eight days of infection, there was a tremendous increase in the number of acetylcholine positive cells. I mean, I cannot believe this. In fact, in some mice, you find almost 70, 80, 90% of the T cells are making acetylcholine of all the different types, not just it's Tregs, TH1, everything. So what do they do? and how it's important because but then again you know we submitted this paper and it was rejected soundly and saying well this is just a correlation so maureen took another two years and now she deleted she with a cd4 cree deleted the acetylcholine transferase from t cells and then infect the mouse with the virus and now it's very, very clear. So with acetylcholine, the T cells actually can clear the virus in about a month to two. But without the yellow square, without the acetylcholine in the T cells for a chronic virus infection, you cannot clear. So that says categorically that T cells make acetylcholine and it's needed for clearing the virus. Now, the mechanisms is very, very complicated. We're just beginning to work out. But one of the mechanisms <clears throat> is that it helps <clears throat> dilate the blood vessels because <clears throat> without <clears throat> chatting the T cells, the blood vessels are fewer and uh, the diameter of the blood vessels are smaller then T cells can't get out. It's almost like the T cells are bringing the acetylcholine directly to the endothelial cells and say I want you to dilate because I want to get out because there is an infection going on. So this then brings to, I think, a new chapter of our study, how the immune cells talk to the brain, and then the brain talks back. Because if you're an infection, the brain knows where it is. So you have the effluent nerves, and you have effluent nerves. And so that is, I think it would be really interesting. And we are now, as I said, half the lab is working on it. We have a, a brilliant Chinese postdoc, um, Chung Xing Zhang uh, from uh, Yu Feng Shi's lab in, in Shanghai and Suchao. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Xiao Feng uh, uh, from I believe it was a Tsinghua University. And more recently, Wang Ying is sending another uh, very talented Chinese postdocs. And we're gonna all work on this to see where we go. So <clears throat> I'm gonna end <clears throat> um, just with saying that this is also involved in, in, in cancers. We can see here, after a tumor, this is the work of Chongqing, uh, the T cells actually 
make more acetylcholine. And that if you delete that, the tumors actually grow faster. So, and, you know, if you go to the literature and look that here is liver cancers, that the acetylcholine receptors, um, that the level of acetylcholine receptors in a liver cancer actually affects uh, the prognosis of the patients. Uh, I think this is really, really exciting. So I want to end <clears throat> by uh, one uh, short story, uh, and that is therefore immunotherapy. You know, the, the tumor microenvironment is way, way, way too complicated. It is not for me because I don't think I have another 20, 30 years to find out. So let's go back to where it got started. Where it got started is the T cell receptor itself. What, what, what goes on? Uh, and the T cell receptor <coughs> is activated in many, many different ways. There are dozens of, remember T cells only have five hours to to divide to catch up with the pathogens and so it has dozens of actually uh, ways of saying go 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 and a few that is going down uh, so to, to the credit of um, uh, several really brilliant people um, first from Israel and then from the US, CAR T was developed. And CAR T is using the T cell receptors in inside, but outside it's a immunoglobulin that recognizes uh, CD19 basically is the most, but it only can, only, can, only can recognize cell surface antigens because the T cells are actually going to kill, when they really do well, they're going to kill all of them. So having a surface marker on cancer cell that also has a low level uh, on some of your crucial organs, like, like, you know, a heart. In fact, CAR T made against her too was killing people uh, because they override uh, and and overrun uh, uh, some important organs. So let's go back to TCRT. But TCRT is a little bit more complicated because you have to recognize the peptide, right? And you have to know the HLA. Now, why is this important? This paper just came out. It says that basically half of all cancers, 50% of all cancers, all different kinds of cancers, pancreas, breast, brain, they they lose their HLA class one or the beta two microglobulin so that the T cells can't find them. Right? When I mean, you have no certain HLA class one, so that means that. And when you do that for every cancer, it's worse prognosis. That strongly implies immunosurveillance is happening. Now, in the field out there, 90% of all the immunologists or immuno-oncologists say when you put in an anti-PD-1 or an anti-CTLA-4, the T cells kill the tumors because of neoantigens. And that's because the correlation of mainly lung and melanomas. But this correlation is not linear, and I beg to differ. It is a very easy conclusion to say they're mutated antigens. I don't want to spend the rest of my life arguing with all of you. I, I need some Mao Tai to get me started again. But I don't think this is what we should be concentrating on. But so if it is not mutated antigen, what it is? Well, there are actually cancer cells express cancer test as antigens. And many of you are of Chinese or East Asian origin, you know pretty well that a lot of cancers are caused by viruses. 
So it could be viral antigens and could be tensor testis antigen. That is right here. But the HLA is very different too, right? So this cancer testis antigen, oh, yeah, yeah. you can see it all living here is this testis and a lot of it in cancers and a lot of it in normals. But you can find here, there are some of them here, NYESO1, WT1, you can find here that's expressed in cancer cells, but not in normal cells. Okay, so they are re expressed, and their expression is usually uh, associated with bad prognosis. Oh, this is for the hematologist. You can you can rank these are normals. You can see here liver, brain, blah blah blah, and these are the cancer testis antigen, right? For leukemia AML. You can find one of these, for example, this one here, that is highly expressed in leukemia, but not expressed in normal cells. Even different subtype of breast cancers have very different cancer testis antigens that are being expressed. Some of you can see this one here, expressing all subtype of, 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 of breast cancers, but not in normal cells. That is really, really a good idea. So, in fact, we are not the first. Uh, and people have bacteria, NYESO1, which is a cancer testis antigen, treating a synuclear sarcoma patient. Look at this, single T cell receptor given to the patient and it's all gone, oh, mostly. So there was NYESO1, HLA-A201, which is the HLA, important to remember. But why A201? Because it's 30% of Europeans and a single digit uh, among uh, uh, East Asians. Okay. But this is very attractive because it's expressed in a lot of different cancer cells. Now this is WT1 and again, HLA A2, a night European, 30%. Uh, again, this TCR in AML is getting really good responses in the 12 patients that were treated, uh, you know, refractory relapse. Uh, it, they lasted for a minimum of three to four years, or uh, medium. Now, these are very high affinity antigen uh, T cell receptor that was found. And so you say, well, so what? Well, this is UV melanoma. This is really nasty, as bad as pancreatic cancer. There is 0.0, .0 drugs ever approved for UV melanoma. Doesn't work with chemo, doesn't work with radiation, it only works for surgery. But if you target a GP100, which is a cancer testis antigen, again in the HLA2, and this group, Immunocore were able to find a high affinity TCR. There you go, extension of eight months of life. And this was recently approved by FDA about two months ago. So this is a disease, you don't, we don't need to know the mutation. We don't need to know the amplification and the deletion. All we need to know is GP100, okay? So now, as I said, I'm gonna add now that what we have a problem here is that the TCR is very, very low affinity. The few that were fished out, luckily were high affinity, but these, are the ones that you really want. And you could also uh, have the advantage for TCRT versus CAR-T that all very few TCRs uh, is needed, whereas CAR-T you need a lot of molecules. But the major, major advantage is that we can go after solid tumors. Now, so how do you go for these? And how do you go for TCR that is beyond the few that are out there that are that are uh, HLA A2, you know. So 
This is um, Naldo Hirano, uh, professor at the University of Toronto, colleague and friend of mine, uh, and his group decided to tackle this problem and spent 10 years doing this. So what they did was they did they found mutations um, that they can create in the HLA class one and class two away, away from the peptide HLA binding groove, away from it, down here. These are the mutations. Okay. And by making those mutations, you can create a very, very high avidity antigen-presenting cells, the CD4, CD8 cells. You can see here, you can see there is actually a three log increase in that ability. And so 10 years later, two papers, one in eLife uh, two years ago and one in Nature Biotech um, a year ago, his lab, you know, was able to make mutations on 38 HLA class 1, 13 HLA class 2, which will cover 90% of the general population in Europe and Asia. Okay. Now, with this, you can now go for hunting for your TCRs. Here, this is the normal tetramer situation staining, nothing. But with these artificial antigen presenting cells or HLA, you can now uh, find, and among these will be numerous T cell receptors at low affinity. And you can map the peptide very easily by just overlapping peptides on the gene. In this case, it's MART1, HLA-B18. In this case, it's NYESO1, HLA-B40. You can map the peptide, and then you can use these peptides as a sense of what is the patient T cells yearning to kill but they can actually not succeed. And then you can clone out the T cell receptor and you can give it back to the patient. Now I'm gonna end by saying viral. Now, I noticed many of us are East Asians. Viral is actually very straightforward in a way. For HPV, E7, this is my friend, Christian Hinrichs. And he's targeted the E7 of the HPV on HLA2 again, and you can see dramatic uh, improvements can be made. Now, going back, for many of us, we're interested in EBV. EBV is not only just for B cell lymphoma, it is for the Southern Chinese and certain parts of Latin America, it is the major cause of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and ENKT lymphomas. These, you can see here, you're fishing out T cells against APNA1 on the HLA-B35.01 background and this is very important. But why is it so important? And this is really had been bothering me for two, three years or more. Okay. The nasopharyngeal carcinoma, the hotspot, is in southern China and in Singapore. Okay. And that coincides with a very unique set of very, very rare HLAs, HLA-A, 0207, not 01, Europeans 0201, HLA-B, 46.01, and HLA-C, 0201. These three HLAs, which do not happen 
occur in many parts of the world contribute to 70 to 80 percent of all nasal pharyngeal carcinoma. B40.01, 25 percent. The frequency in the population is 13 percent. The frequency in the cancer is 25 percent. It's doubled, and the p value 10 to the minus 32. A201 again doubled from the general population to the nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, again, p-value minus 32. O one O two again, you can see here, doubled and amazing. And then you have those alleles, HLA 1101, which is the most frequent HLA among Chinese. It's actually protective in general. But the southern Chinese alleles are actually risk. And you can see here, Singapore Chinese is about 13%. Hong Kong Chinese is about 13%. You go to Japanese, it's only 1%. Uh, so you can see we are really in the beginning of a big, big puzzle. Uh, and that having these reagents will allow us to address some of the problems, not only hopefully to make an impact on the patients, but, but we're gonna learn a heck of a lot. And that's what we all hear about. Now, this is the group that has been involved in a, a company that has started uh, uh, by Naoto Hirano, Mark Davis, <laughs> it's Mark Davis. <laughs> uh, he was 30 years old, I uh, was 32. Uh, and this is uh, Pam Ohashi, who's uh, been working with us for now uh, uh, almost 30 years. And uh, these are the people who made this happen uh, in Toronto and in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much, Tak. Uh, this is really um, cover a lot of grants. I think there's already questions pulling. Um, well, I mean, I'm gonna start with the Q and A. Uh, Yusheng, you want to go ahead to ask the question? Well, I mean, okay, I'm gonna to read the question to Tak. Um, Thank you for this mass class lecture. Um, I'm wondering whether innate immune cells such as macrophage undergo exhaustions as T cell as well? I do not know very much about macrophages. I don't think the world by and large knows a lot and I know less. Uh, macrophages is um, like, um, you know, there's a book uh, English book for little clicks, they call clickly click. They change by the second uh, to many different things. And it's not macrophage, not M1, not M2. All the single cell RNA seq data from our lab and from other labs are now showing it is almost impossible to iron down uh, these cells. They're very versatile. They're, overall, there is some kind of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, uh, partly due to some of the cytokines and chemokines they produce. I do not know how to answer the question. They play a role, but how they play the role, I don't know. And so I do think that a lot of people are beginning now to target macrophages. But one of the biggest problems is macrophages in man is completely different from macrophages in mouse in many, many ways. For example, the mouse have this uh, receptor called pair B, which is anti-inflammatory, and pair A, uh, which is inflammatory. But the human has it's the equivalent of LILRA, but there are six of them, LILRA, one, two, three, four, five, six, and ARB, one, two, three, four, five. So a human is very, very, very 
complicated. And interestingly, E-stations have deleted LILRA3 in their germline. And it's, you know, so it's a big, I, I wish I know more about macrophages, I don't. Okay, so I saw um, other question from Xiao Jing Chen. Uh, you want to go ahead to ask question, Xiao Jing? All right, so I'm gonna just also read the questions. Wonderful lecture, I'm wondering whether um, the reversing cymic uh, evolution uh, or enhancing cymic output has a potential to inhibit tumor in adult or old patients. Uh, I don't really think so because I think it's a you know although when 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 the kids are young, and this is a very very interesting question. When a kid is young, that that whole thymus number one is very very big thymus kids, proportion to the size of their body. Number two, there's a tremendous amount of turnover. Uh, 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 of these thymic cells, uh, uh, in the, but after that, the, the thymic, uh, uh, the, the, the T cells can be made uh, outside the thymus, uh, and I think they continue to be made. Um, I don't think that is going to change, uh, although I don't know the answer. Okay, okay. Um, Okay, so the next question is from Finland. Um, Faye, you want to go ahead to ask a question? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Uh, 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 thank you very much, TechMark, for the wonderful talk. Uh, my question is uh, simple. Uh, uh, cancer testis antigen, uh, will that only working for men? Maybe I uh, don't really understand the detail. And also, will that attack uh, testis? That's my question. Uh, there's been a lot of trials. Uh, the, the, the effect to the test is, is minimal. Um, and, uh, you know, even if it is, you know, if you're going to die of cancer or lose your testes, what would you choose? Sure. <laughs> uh, but, but there have been a lot of trials. There are some toxicity <clears throat> on some cancer testis antigens. Um, surprisingly, a lot of them uh, have been very, very well tolerated. Yeah. Okay, so so that's not only working for men, and the, it also worked for women, right? It just oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, it's it. You know, I think if you if it's uh, it's 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 expressed very very high. It, so it, it's not just testes. These are antigens that express during development when you were an embryo. Uh, but then they re-express. I mean, you know, I think uh, alpha fetal protein, right, they re-express in, in liver cancer and testicular cancer. Uh, it's not found in your normal liver. Uh, so, so that's the kind of, you know, concept. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Zhao Qian. Uh, Zhao, you want to uh, go ahead to ask questions? Uh, thank you. Hi, um, this is uh, Qian from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, thank you, Professor Mac, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, it's very exci uh, exciting to see the uh, new antigen, the tumor-specific antigen-based uh, uh, CTRT therapy. The effect was uh, wonderful. Uh, so new antigen must play an important role there. How would you suggest us to uh, identify, to look for these uh, effective uh, tumor-specific antigens? Uh, do you think uh, we can find some shared new antigens for a group of patients, or do you think it has to be personalized? Thank you. Uh, to some extent, it has to be, be personalized because of the HLA. But um, as you can see here, um, once we find, a, so this one, let's say, is for DP4 NYESO1. 
and the, the peptide we mapped is 157 to 170, right? And then from here, you pick out the TCRs, and all the TCRs um, that you can pick up will be recording DP4 and NYE, so on. And the advantage of our platform is that now we can have multiple of these TCRs and we can test them. But once it's been tested, then as long as you are DP4 and you have NYESO1, it, you can you know, be uh, a subject to, to, be, to take this particular TCR. So it is personalized to a point. So let's say, for example, HLA A11 is 30 to 40 percent of all Chinese, okay, from north to south. If you have a TCR against HLA A11 and the peptide is alpha fetal protein AFP, and of course you have to fish it out, you have to map it, you can treat up to one third of all Chinese with liver cancer. So it is personalized to some extent, but past the HLA and the peptide, you don't need to personalize. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So we already have dozens of these TCRs ready to go. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, so next question is from uh, Li Guangfu. Uh, Guangfu, you want to go ahead and ask a question? Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay, Dr. Mark, so you give that great talk. So you already show it's the brain and the, and the immune system have the collection through some so such as ST calling. So I have another question. In addition to the brain, do you have opportunity to look at other organs such as the liver have the direct impact on the immunity, specifically on the tumor? Because when we started, we we looking for some, we review some literature. We find that if some patients receive the liver transplantation, so this kind of the patient looks like it's more, it have the high frequency to get the liver cancer there. Um, so this is, a, this is a topic we are very, very interested in. And we, we actually uh, have a German postdoc working on it. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you the results. Uh, it is acetylcholine is very, very involved in uh, the liver. But do but you have, hmm. Yeah, it, but it's really only T cells and B cells that make them. So is that if this is true, so is that actually so is the liver infiltrate liver resident T cells? Do you have some opportunity to show that liver resident T cells they can secrete so cells calling so when the tumor grows? So what's the difference between them in the normal liver and the tumor liver? Are there any difference for the liver resident or tumor resident T cells in the production of the cell calling? Yes, so I just show you that this is the work of uh, Chongxing Zhang, uh, a student from uh, um, Fang Shi's. Uh, I think Yufang's actually, um, uh, at, I, I think he logged on at the talk. Uh, maybe he isn't, if he is, to say hello. You can see here, after the tumor has developed, you have more acetylcholine producing T cells. Right, from right. about one percent to about three percent, but not uh, in uh, the B cells or in the CD8 cells. So only in the CD4 cells. Okay, and then now if you delete this, 
So they can no longer make acetylcholine, right? Then what you do is your tumor is uh, bigger. Uh, and so uh, it would suggest that there is immunosurveillance. Uh, the mechanism of this is, is not as simple as just getting out of the blood vessels. It's more complicated and uh, uh, this paper is uh, in revision. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is very good evidence. I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> I probably said so. Is that I, 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 I probably went too fast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one is from Xiaolei. Xiaolei, go ahead. Uh, hey, Tak. Uh, this is really inspiring uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in. Um, when you mentioned the difference between TCR and the CAR, uh, so the, the binding affinity uh, uh, for the CAR2 antigen is much higher to, uh, 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 as compared to the, the TCR with peptide MHC, but the, the, the threshold, the, the minimum number of, of antigens that is required to activate a, a TCRT uh, is actually much lower as compared to the CAR-T. So uh, I, I think like in the field, there are many models trying to uh, explain this sort of uh, 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 dilemma. Um, so why you have a tighter binding, but uh, has actually you need like uh, 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 more antigen uh, to activate this T cell. So uh, for example, if it's due to the, the uh, co-receptor or it's because of the, the structure difference between the TCR and the CAR. So uh, what, what's, what's your uh, uh, favorite model here? Okay. Um, so first of all, I, what I want to say here, uh, before I forget, my lab is uh, going to be uh, expanding on this topic, TCRT, and also expanding on the brain part in, in a big way uh, uh, in Toronto and in Hong Kong. So any one of you who would like to come, the young people, and, you know, uh, would join our lab, I'll be very, very, very happy, okay? So basically, to coming back to your question is that this is a synapse. A synapse is when the antigen presenting cell and the T cell form. This synapse uh, requires a, a lot of molecules, CD80, 3, CD80, um, class 1, 2, TCR, ICAM, LFA, LFA, CD2. So this is a synapse, it's like a trigger. When the TCR triggers this, it sends a signal in and say, everybody comes to the party. And this formation is not happening in CAR-T because what CAR-T does uh, is, it would be an antibody that recognize CD19 or CD20, CD22, BCMA, et cetera, et cetera. But this particular triggering causes a tremendous increase. You can see here by improving this, you see, you can see the mutations are all in this area, which interacts better with these other molecules right here. And you actually can increase the affinity ability by three logs by making the synapse form faster and stronger. In the case of CAR-T, there is no synapse. And that's the main difference. Okay, so, so in, in other words, uh, if uh, we can uh, do some way to, to improve the, the synapse formation of CAR, T, then there is also a, a possibility that to to in, uh, to to increase the the antigen sensitivity, it, that that that, that make, makes sense to you. Uh, you know, 
It, it does to some extent because the synapse will feed information back to the T cells. And the T cell says, I have now found the peptide and the HRA, and we are all ready to go, right? So in a CAR T, you have to be able to, to create a synapse, which is not present in a CAR T. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that's uh, I think that uh, that sounds uh, because I think yeah the CAR T synapse is very different because it doesn't have this traditional bull eye like structure as compared to the the TCR synapse. Um, okay. This, this this synapse is made for the ability that we can detect very few peptides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks so much, Tech, for uh, sharing your thoughts. Can I ask a question? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. you have to you have to wait in line. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, just three more. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, first one from uh, Tao Fang. So, um, I mean, the question is, when when the tumor new antigen peptides are directly used to treat tumors, is the length of the peptide 9AA better or, uh, or longer fragment peptide are better? Used to stimulate antigen presenting cells and then activate T cell to play anti-tumor effect. So it, it depends on the HRA. HRA class 1A, the, the, um, the pocket is, is, is closed. So it can only, um, Accommodate uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight to nine, because this is closed. <clears throat> okay, so it would not fit anything that is ten, and anything that is seven is probably not stable. So mm. for class one HRA, it's usually or almost all the time eight or nine. Now. HLA class two, it, this is open-ended. So this here is not there. So you can have a, you can have a peptide that is very long. It can go all the way over and hang out, okay? For class two. Then for class one B, it's a little bit longer. You can take about 10 or 11. So it depends. Class two is open-ended. You can find 10, 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, usually yeah. not more than that. Class one A, eight or nine, no more. <clears throat> Class one B, 10, 11. Okay, okay. Um, I think next question is from Drink. Uh, Drink, go ahead. Your you can ask question. You can. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Doctor Mark. Uh, very wonderful talk. Uh, uh, this is uh Drink Wei from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, I have a question regarding the MR vaccine. So we know that MR vaccine now uh, now is successfully used for anti COVID nineteen. So what do you think the application of the MR vaccine uh, for anti-tumor? So have you ever uh, used any the cancer antigen to design the MR vaccine uh, to, uh, I mean, to against the tumor? Uh, talk, I uh, think you, you, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Hello? No, I think Tark need to unmute your, oh. himself. Oh, oh. All right. Am I okay now? Yeah, yeah, you're okay. Yeah. So uh, Moderna actually, original idea, uh, there were dozens of, of, of different applications, uh, one of which, or many of several of which were cancer vaccine uh, 
and, and that's going on, and I do not know the results. Um, but I, I'm not a strong supporter of cancer vaccines. I think it's, it, it, it's been around for decades, and it has never really worked. I, so, I think so, a lot of people uh, don't even take HLA into consideration. They just throw everything in. It's not going to work. Okay, okay. Because for for MR vaccine for virus, because they have specific antigen, I think for for cancer, because uh, it's very difficult to find a specific cancer and an uh, antigen or like a new antigen. So I think that's the the problem. There is, there is, there is, what, what is a cancer surface antigen? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's totally different from the, the virus or, or like bacteria. Yeah, this, this is, a, this is a, a CD4, CD8 T cells play. It's not an immunoglobulin play. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the next question is from Oh Jianpeng. Jianpeng, you want to go ahead and mute yourself? All right, I'm going to uh, just uh, read the question. Um, how do the affinity of TCR or CAR affect the activation or function or even exhaustion of the, of the T cells? Uh, that is a question not really completely understood. Uh, I, I, a priori, I would say that um, we published the paper in 1993 in Science. Uh, and uh, with Pam Ohashi, and we said that the low affinity T cells, as long as you have more, will do uh, the same amount of work as a high affinity T cell to the peptide HLA. And my hunch, and I don't, I cannot prove it in vivo is that the low affinity would be less likely to be exhausted than the high affinity. But I'm just guessing. Mm. Okay, well, you found you the, you the next one. Go ahead, ask a question. Okay, uh, take us. So is it possible that uh, the uh, TCRT, they can get into the uh, solid tumor Maybe possibly produce more acetylcholine than CAR T. That is, you know, you friend, you should come to my lab. Uh, and I start. want to do a postdoc with you. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. With my student, yeah. <laughs> you bring a lot of multi, I'll take you. Um, <laughs> uh, so actually, that's a very, very interesting question. You know the. You know, you know, uh, uh, you friend, What is the number one toxicity of CAR T? This uh, IR six, I think. That possible? Yeah, no, but what is the what is the you know what is the toxicity? It's I mean, overreactivity. And and what does that do? And and the and the, uh, the system. It goes into the brain. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Yeah. So is that does that suggest the acetylcholine dilating blood vessels? Mm, yeah, yeah, okay. That, that why, what's the big difference between the two signals, you know? The CAR, of course, is very, is abbreviated the signal directly rather than the CAR TCR, rather than the TCR T. Well, the TCR T too, but I think um, because, because the, the T cell, you, because you need over a thousand T cell receptors, you mm -hmm. you have to work on the T cell receptor very 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 strongly for the CAR T. Whereas uh, for a TCRT, you only need ten. Uh, Mark Davis said you only need one. Uh, okay. uh, so maybe they're not working as hard. But if you have to work very hard to 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 attack 1,000 
CD19 plus on the, on the tumor uh, cell, maybe you make more acetylcholine and you dilate the blood vessels and through the blood brain barrier, get into the brain and, 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 and kill you. Um, so that, that is the number one toxicity of CAR T is, is the T. I mean, is it really related to too much cytokine? Maybe just too much cytokine already, you know. It's a yeah, I, thing, uh, as the right. I, well, that's a very good question too. Uh, I don't know what um, certain cytokines, like uh, we published uh, uh, that IL-21 would uh, increase the acetylcholine uh, production, uh, you know, a lot. Uh -huh. But would, would some decrease it? I don't know. I, I haven't, we haven't studied, we should. So, I mean, so after I, uh, T cell activation in a virus infected cell uh, in days three or day four in the mouse, some mouse have 100% of the T cells pumping out acetylcholine. Wow, okay. But it cannot be a overreactive. If, if overreactive the cells and the go apoptosis, then they produce the acetylcholine esterase. You remember that the paper we published. Yeah, but that is very, very, very short life. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so I guess. Um... I'm going to take the last question uh, following Yifang's uh, question. Uh, Tak, I want to, I'm wondering actually the, the acetylcholine um, expression you, you, you observe in the T cells during the viral infection. Uh, I, I would like to hear your comment whether this infection modulates the acetylcholine secretion, biosynthesis, transcription regulation, uh, which one is the one dominant machinery during the viral infection? So I, that's a very, very good question. I think for different cells, in neurons, the, the limiting factor is not the acetylcholine transferase. Right. Uh, uh, it, it is the, this is the choline receptor that is the limiting factor for neurons to transmit a, 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 you know, a signal. Uh, for the T cells, it is to a large extent the synthesis of CHAT, the upregulation mm. of the enzyme acetylcholine transferase. Uh, and uh, and uh, to what extent are uh, other uh, limiting factors uh, uh, like, uh, um, you know, choline. Uh, there's a paper coming out uh, that is really suggesting that this is really involved in immunotherapy. Um, I'm not going to, you know, uh, the paper is, is almost in press. Uh, and, uh, and it may suggest that this is really important. So you think the T cell actually, um, you know, usually the vesicle carry the uh, acetylcholine from the neuron, usually the uh, calcium signal uh, dependent. But in the T cell case, uh, do you have any insight I mean, I don't know whether this um, secretion uh, or excitosis of acetylcholine from the T cell is somehow also calcium dependent. Uh, so the nicotinic receptors are calcium dependent, mm -hmm. but the muscarinic receptors are not. I see. And and uh, uh, and those are GPCRs, uh, yeah. and they both involved, and it's very very complicated. Mm. Okay. And it, you know, macrophages are involved. But, um, uh, in 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 the sense that acetylcholine actually inactivates macrophages, uh, yeah. and, and, but then it will activate other things uh, like T cells, and so the macrophage, the 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 alpha seven nicotinic receptor is a negative signal. Um, but the charm three, the muscarinic receptor, uh, is is by and large a, a an activation. It's very very complicated. You have dozens of these receptors going on. 
I mean, you know, you, you actually can can see why why all these receptors, if 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 acetylcholine is only found in the neurons, why all these receptors on every tissue? Right. Because the Not T cells and the B cells uh, uh, carry acetylcholine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, probably evolutionary co-evolved with immune neuron crosstalk to more efficiently modulate the innate immune response or anti-tumor response. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it's really half my lab is, is working on it. And I, as I said, in addition to Yu Fang, I welcome all of you to come. We, we need a lot of good people. <laughs> yeah, I guess we all do. Um, well, okay. Well, I think that's pretty much about it. Um, thank you so much, Tak. It's really wonderful to see you again and in a wonderful lecture. We really appreciated your time. And I think all of us actually really learn a lot from your lecture. Um, I hope, let's say, I uh, hopefully we can see each other pretty soon in, in person. Yes, you better store up the uh, amount I am ready to come. <laughs> I will. Yes. Will do. It's thank you so there much. For you. Yeah, thank you so much. You thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Send, send more uh, Chongqing. <laughs> okay, yes. yes. We are ready. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Chung Singh is uh, is ready to come back. Uh, he has a oh, job. Okay. We have to find a lab for him. No, no, no. We found a lab for him. He's going to Hong Kong. Okay. That, yeah. That's a competition. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I hope thank you. See you guys next time. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.